Okay, guys, well, thanks for coming. Um, okay, um, I'm going to start with uh, what happened in April this year in the uh, state of Louisiana. House of Representatives voted by 66 votes to 27 to reject House Bill 12 that would have um, repealed its anti-sodomy laws that go back to 1805. This law carries a sentence of up to five years imprisonment for consensual oral or anal sex. And although it was declared unconstitutional by the United States Supreme Court, only as recently as 2003, by the way, it nevertheless continues to be on the Louisiana State statute books and is used to harass um, uh, lesbian, uh, gay and LGBT people. For example, in July 2013, a man was arrested for, quote, attempted crimes against nature, which is a phrase that we will be coming back to, um, uh, after entrapment by a, uh, an undercover police officer. Meanwhile, the Louisiana Christian Family Forum said that to repeal the law would remove protection of children from sexual assault, because in common with many other laws, on the question of uh, um, homosexual acts. There is no distinction uh, 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 between age or and often between the question of consent, therefore equating homosexual acts with rape and um, uh, paedophilia. Um, the states of Alabama, Florida, Idaho, Kansas, Michigan, Mississippi, North Carolina, Oklahoma, South Carolina, Texas, and Utah all have similar illegal anti-sodomy laws on their statute books. Meanwhile, in the LGBT uh, Hall of Shame of Human Rights Watch for 2013, at the top of their Hall of Shame was an organization called the American Center for Law and Justice for, quote, attempting to export homophobia to Africa. This is an organization that was founded in 1990 by the American TV evangelist Pat Robinson, Pat Robertson, who some of you will have heard of, and it works through an offshoot organization such as uh, the East African Center for Law and Justice in Kenya. Um, another American evangelist, Scott Lively, was very active in Uganda in the run-up to the passing of the uh, recent um, anti-homosexuality bill. He spoke to uh, many meetings of many thousands of people, uh, whipping, up, uh, whipping up homophobia. He addressed the Ugandan parliament. Uh, this is somebody who wrote a book called The Pink Swastika, which accuses homosexuals of being, quote, the true inventors of Nazism. Uh, another high position in the Hall of Shame goes to the Ukrainian fascist organisation uh, Svoboda, uh, who now have, are heavily represented in the Ukrainian parliament. One of its former MPs, uh, Irina Farian, said, quote, they should be cured. I don't make comments about sick people. I don't understand what you are asking me about. They need to be cured. She is very close to the Ukrainian Orthodox Church and claims to be inspired by God. Uh, opposing uh, Svoboda, of course, in the Ukraine is Vladimir Putin, who has recently presided over a bill that outlaws the, quote, promotion of homosexuality, a lot of language very similar to our own um, uh, uh, section, 20, section 28, um, uh, and um, uh, a, a, a law which has led to numerous vicious attacks on LGBT people, and he also uh, has recently been looking to alliances with the church in Russia, uh, um, uh, uh, as has been highlighted recently by the case of uh, Pussy Riot. This is something that we're seeing uh, across Europe, a kind of tie-up between the Catholic Church and fascist and far-right organisations coming together around questions of the family, homophobia, abortion, and so on. This was very, this was very um, visible in the recent Day of Rage demonstration in France. Um, and it also happened recently in uh, Poland, where um, LGBT activists uh, have been attacked um, after after a recent LGBT rights march. The Pol group of Polish fascists, together with um, together with uh, 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 people from the Catholic Church, um, attacked a, a kind of rainbow arch that had been set up and set it and set it on fire. And one bystander who was watching it. 
um, who've been involved in um, uh, uh, anti-fascist marches over here said that it was like watching a demonstration of the EDL but with the Catholic Church joining in. And this is a, this is a, this is a common phenomenon. In France, actually, historically, the fascists haven't really taken up these questions. Uh, they haven't been central to them. The really question of immigration has been central, but they are now looking to join forces with the um, with the Catholic Church. I think it's important to start with those examples because there's a narrative being pushed in the West that really we are so liberal and the problem is all with Muslims and Africans. And I think it's important to go through those examples that I went through in order to give some kind of um, perspective to uh, put into the discussion around the more high drive cases that we've seen um, uh, uh, with the passing of bills in, in um, Uganda, Malawi, and, Malawi and, uh, and, uh, and so on. Because I think for us, we have to really look at the overarching the arching picture and try and get an understanding of why it is that LGBT rights are under attack globally and what connects the different examples around the world and what we can learn from the specifics of each country and in particular what we can learn about resistance and how we can get rid of LGBT oppression and fight for a truly liberated society. So I want really to start with some things that are constant across all societies today. And the first thing is that, as Marx put it, the ideas of it in any society, the dominant ideas in any society, are the ideas of the ruling class, of the people that own the means of production, also own the means of uh, mental production, the production of ideas, the media, the universities, etc., etc. And that, um, uh, and, and that is true whether or not it is a ruling class that is um, native to that country or whether it is an imperialist, uh, uh, um, an, an, an imperialist um, ruling class. And in particular, when you look at ideas about sexuality, those ideas are shaped by the family and the particular forms of family that develop in different class societies. Engels, uh, went through the way in which the family developed with the emergence of class society. But of course, since then, it has taken, um, in different parts of the world, in different periods of time, different shapes. And the shape and the form that it's taken, in turn, has shaped people's thoughts about, um, sh uh, 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 shaped the, the, the dominant ideas of those society. Uh, and so our common sense ideas uh, that, we, that we have today really about the family, the, the common sense ideas that exist in society, were formed at the end of the 19th century to prop up a particular kind of family in the wake of the Industrial Revolution, with a very strict division between uh, the private and public spheres and very strict roles for men and women within that. And it was around this time uh, uh, in the middle to the, from the middle to the end of the 19th century, that you began to, that you saw the, 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 the development of the category of a person as a homosexual, as opposed to um, the outlawing of certain acts that may be committed by all different sorts of people, they just happen to have committed those acts. You begin to see a, a, a particular category of person, the homosexual, who is a threat to the emerging, to the um, emerging nuclear family. So that's one thing that shapes our ideas. But it's not all one way. Um, you know, we're not kind of crude about this. You've got this family, therefore you've got these ideas, and that's really all there is to say about it. Because, of course, the other thing that class society does is engenders resistance, because built into class society is a dynamic between the working class and the ruling class, which produces resistance. And the level of resistance in society uh, is, it, it also plays a part in shaping prevailing ideas. And therefore, the question of leadership within that resistance is also, a, is also uh, an important question. So if you look around the world today, you could point to an economic crisis on um, a massive scale, resulting in a polarization of, of politics uh, sometimes to the right and sometimes to the left. We've seen recently with the results of the um, of the uh, um, of, of the European elections, crime, uh, of the European elections. You can see mass upheavals, especially in the Arab world. And you, alongside that, you you see an attempt by the ruling class to look for scapegoats as they fear losing control. And those scapegoats are often immigrants, people from another country 
but in some cases leaders can also latch on to other easy targets such as LGBT people and paint them as undermining undermining society, undermining the um, undermining the family, and playing on people's fears and people's desire for um, stability in an uncertain world. And this is particularly true when those leaders are attempting to portray themselves as a strong man, and it is usually um, um, a man, although women are joining in quite happily, unfortunately, um, on the imperialist stage, standing up for national or traditional values against the decadent West and against imperialism and, uh, 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 and, uh, and so on. Now, of course, it's never a simple issue. Homophobia exists because of the way that the ruling class have sought to promote and defend the family and to exercise control over the lives of um, over the lives of uh, ordinary people who they see as mere fodder for exploitation. But the terrain in which that battle um, uh, 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 takes place can vary enormously. So at, 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 over time and over and, and in different places. So attitudes towards same-sex activity in the Middle East and North Africa up until the 20th century were very advanced compared to those in the West. And at the same time, missionaries in sub-Saharan Africa were shocked at the disturbing sexual practices that they saw. But today, it looks like there's almost been a complete turnaround and the West likes to portray itself as this liberal place where, you know, we accept women's rights and we accept LGBT rights and really we've got to go and deliver civilization to these barbaric countries. Um, and uh, uh, um, and uh, and so on, and try to use it as a justification for um, Islamophobia, racist stereotyping, and imperial intervention. Really, an example of how capitalism is able to subsume ideas that uh, can come to the fore in times of in times of resistance, and take it and then use it back against the um, uh, against the the the, uh, the 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 working class around around the world. So. I want really to look at some of the myths around um, homophobia in Africa and the Middle East, and the way that that kind of fits into that um, fits into that agenda. Because the most common myth promoted by um, supporters of anti-homosexuality laws in places like Uganda is that homosexuality is a disease, or it's been imported. By the by, Western imperialists, and it has no part in African tradition. Or if it does, it's not in this particular country. It's another country, or it's not my tribe. It's another tribe, and uh, uh, um, and so on. And I think that we should uh, argue very strongly that it's not homosexual practices that are imperialist imported to Africa, but. Um, but the particular version of homophobia that exists inside Africa. So I, wouldn't, I wouldn't want to say completely that homophobia has been imported because I wouldn't want to imply uh, there was no homophobia at all there in the first place, just that it was different and took a different form, and that for all people, African, non-African people, Islamic people, non-Islamic non people, of course you will find people who are homophobic, people who are not homophobic, people who will, who will defend their rights, people who will oppose their rights, and so on. But in the particular institutionalised form that homophobia took in Africa, um, it, that is that is a product of um, imperialist. Um, that is a product of um, imperialist rule. So when um, when President Museveni of Uganda complained that homosexuality was against the tradition of his country, he obviously didn't have in mind King uh, Mwanda II of Uganda, which is now part of modern day Uganda. He defended his traditional values in the 1880s by beheading 22 young men who had converted to Christianity and refused to have sex with him. Um, and I think this story illustrates uh, a few important points about the question of imperialism and sexuality. First of all, it makes it quite clear that same-sex activity did take place in Africa before um, uh, uh, um, before imperialism. But it also, um, I think, looks at the way that laws governing sexuality were used both to try to define a morally superior Christianity um, uh, uh, from a primitive, promiscuous society as a means of control over the local population. Incidentally, uh, King Wanda himself later converted to Christianity and capitulated to the, um, to the, to the British Empire. Now, in fact, if you look at these laws, the uh, uh, anti-homosexuality laws uh, in Uganda, they already had laws in place for life imprisonment, and the roots of those laws actually go back to 
the Indian Penal Code of uh, 1860. And when I talked about that phrase about carnal sins against nature, crimes against nature, you see almost word for word the same wording used in country after country in the um, across the British Empire. The mandate to devise the Indian Penal Code, which was drawn up for the Indian Colony, was handed to a certain uh, Thomas Babington Macaulay, who, as you can imagine, was a complete racist scumbag who was in charge of the Indian Colony. For example, he famously said that he thought that everything that had been written in Sanskrit and Arabic really um, summed up as much intellectual knowledge as you could get into one book that was written in English and forced, he forced everybody to study in the English language and so on. It was first, it, he, he first took up drafting the Indian Penal Code in 1825. It was interesting that actually when it was, when it was, when it was rushed through, it was in the aftermath of the Indian Mutiny of, uh, the Indian Mutiny of uh, 18, 57 and 58. And in a sense, the colonies were seen as a good place to experiment with laws that were later implemented in Britain. They could be imposed at will without having to go through any pretense of any kind of uh, uh, d uh, democracy. And according to one 19th century historian, Macaulay had, quote, um, a free field for experimentation. Now, the legislation itself is filled with lots of vague references when it talks about sodomy, which is very ty typical of the laws as they were indeed also being shaped um, in Britain at the time. So, for example, Clause 361 and 3, I'm quoting here from the code, Clause 361 and 362 relate to an odious class of offences about which it is desirable that as little as possible should be said. We are decidedly of the opinion that the injury which would be done to the morals of the community by such discussion would far more than compensate for any benefits which might be derived from legislative measures framed with great, the greatest provision. It kind of gives you a free hand to do what you like, really, doesn't it? Um, oh, not do it, but which side you're on. Um, the most influential clause was clause 377, which said that our natural offence is whosoever voluntarily has carnal intercourse against the order of nature with any man, woman or beast shall be punished with uh, imprisonment. And that phrase that I mentioned before about carnal intercourse against the laws of nature and the linking together actually of sodomy laws with, um, uh, with bestiality and so on actually goes right back to the Middle Ages, goes back to um, 16th century, goes back to uh, 16th century, um, you know, uh, vocabulary, the way that they, talk, the way that they talked, about, talked about laws then. Um, it's very interesting, there was no distinction uh, on the question of consent, consent, uh, uh, consensual sex, whether it was, whether it was voluntary or in, in, involuntary. Questions of what constituted carnal intercourse against the, the order of nature was left open to interpretation. But essentially, the Indian Penal Code was transported to and modified by other British colonies and used as a model back in Britain for changes to the Offences Against the People Act of 1861. The um, Indian Penal Code became the model for legal systems throughout the British colony, and as each, as each colony took it up, they kind of amended it and updated it in their own, uh, in their own way. Administrators of the various colonies basically just decided which bits they wanted, which they didn't, which they wanted to change, and so on. Um, including, uh, and, and this became the basis of the law in Kenya and Uganda. And I think it's also, I talked about it coming in the aftermath of the uh, Indian mutiny, it's pointing out that this is part of a method of general social control. So there were also laws about vagrancy, about trespass, about who could go where, who could meet where, and, um, and, um, and, and, and so on. Later in Britain, in 1885, what was known as the Labrachere Amendment brought in the offence of gross indecency, under which Oscar Wilde was um, prosecuted. That later appeared in 1899 in the Sudanese Penal Code. Um, another influential code was the Queensland Penal Code, which was drafted in 1899 by the uh, Colonist Chief Justice Sir Samuel Griffith, and that was the second most influential co uh, code after the Indian one. The Chief Justice of Northern Nigeria, a certain H.C. Golan, adopted it as that country's legal code in 1904, and it became the code for uh, unified Nigeria in 1916, and Kenya, Uganda, and Tanzania moved to imitate it. It's just worth quoting something that God had said about it. He said, the Queensland Code appealed to me, uh, 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 appeared to me to keep it in a much more satisfactory manner than any of the other codes I've seen, 
the mean between over elaboration on the one hand and over compression on the other. So there you go, it's completely at the whim of the local administrator. So I'm going to end like this one because it wasn't too elaborate, it wasn't too short, so we'll have that one. So the idea that this has anything whatsoever to do with traditional African values is complete and utter nonsense. These were brought in on the whim of colonial administrators without any reference whatsoever to the local population, who, of course, the colonial masters saw as, um, uh, 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 you know, as completely lax and, uh, you know, a kind of haven for uh, unnatural offences. So, for example, Lord Elgin, the Viceroy of India, warned that um, British military camps could become, quote, replicas of Sodom and Gomorrah as soldiers acquired special oriental vices. Uh, the explorer, uh, Richard Burton, postulated something called the um, satanic zone around the equator in which the vice is popular and endemic while races to the north and south of the limits here defined practice it only sporadically amidst the opprobrium of their fellows now in fact this notion that there are certain parts of africa where same-sex acts were rare and frowned upon is also itself a product of the racism of the colonists and their uh, and their missionaries because the the notion that was developing around homosexuality back in Britain at the time really was representing it as some kind of deviance brought about by various abominations, but most crucially as something that was unnatural. Whereas their view of Africans was that they were primitives, living close to nature in a rampantly um, heterosexual uh, 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 environment. And, and so that didn't quite fit with this idea that homosexuality was, un, was unnatural. So they chose quite simply to ignore examples of same-sex um, activity where they came across it, or sometimes to say that it had been brought in from, uh, 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 from uh, for example, Indian labourers coming to work on the railways and so on. In other words, it was, it was, it, it was brought in from... Um, it was brought in from outside because these people uh, were a bit more developed, a bit less natural, and they weren't um, good Christians. Um, now, of course, thanks to um, uh, researchers such as Murray and Roscoe, a guy called Mark Epperett, we know there's a long history of same-sex practices throughout the... Um, oh, sorry, I should also add that uh, one explorer, Evans Pritchard, did document uh, uh, a lot of same-sex activity, but chose not to write about it publicly and not to bring it out into the public until um, shortly before his death. But thanks to modern research, we do know that there's a long history of same-sex practices throughout the continent of Africa, from warriors taking boy wives to men living with uh, uh, men living as women and marrying uh, other men, to same-sex activity amongst um, uh, migrant mine workers. Uh, to examples of lesbian sex among the Basopo women which have been chronicled and so on. These acts took place for a number of, of, uh, of reasons and fulfilled a variety of social functions. And I, don't, I think we should probably not attempt to impose our ideas about being gay in the 21st uh, century Western society on them, but they certainly give the lie to the claims of people like uh, Museveni that uh, same-sex activity is somehow un-African. I think perhaps what's interesting to look at is why, with the end of imperialism, with the end of colonialism, and the rise of black African leaders, did, um, did uh, the colonial laws against sodomy remain and the myth about the alien nature of homosexuality continue to exist? And I think you have to look both at the function of the laws and the politics of the resistance to imperialism. So essentially the laws were saying, we're the morally pure, you're the backward, and, uh, you know, backward people of depraved sexuality. And the independence movement uh, rightly rebelled against that, uh, that racist stereotype, but they did so in a way that tended to emphasise a more conservative sexuality. And their leaders were not from the poorer sections of society, but part of a growing black middle class that was educated in Paris and London, and very keen to show that they were part of the modern world and their politics were often influenced by Stalinism that of course had rolled back the gains of the Russian Revolution including with regard to uh, women's liberation, rights for sexual minorities and greater sexual freedom and, uh, uh, um, and so on. And I think given all that, it's perhaps not surprising to find uh, Jomo Kenyatta who studied at the LSE and went on to become the first black president of Kenya writing in a 1938 study of his Gikuyu tribe, quote, any form of sexual intercourse other than the natural form between men and women acting in a normal way is out of the question. 
It is considered taboo even to have sexual intercourse with a woman in any position except the regular one, face to face. I'm not with the you try. But, you know, the, the, the question is the extent to which that is true, because what researchers have shown, of course, is our very wide spectrum of sexual behaviours across all tribes in all parts of Africa. Now, perhaps they, perhaps the Kikuyu tribe were much closer to one end of that spectrum, but actually, there's no discussion whatsoever of whether or not the taboo was broken, how often it was broken, why it was broken, what happened to people who broke it, or, um, anything, uh, or anything like that. Importantly, the new governments that came to power kept much of the old state machinery and legislation intact as they attempted to exploit the local workforce in order, in, in, in order to bring their economies into the modern era. Now, of course, the nationalist governments ultimately failed to bring in the economic wealth that they had promised to the vast majority of the population. And in the face of the world economic crisis of ferment at home, they act as any ruling class does and seek to find scapegoats and sow division. Uh, the fact that since the 1960s, a more open LGBT politics has emerged in the West as a result of struggle is something that hasn't passed these, uh, these, these leaders by. And they are latching on to that in an attempt to portray themselves when they stand against um, uh, uh, LGBT rights to be standing up to, um, to, to, to be standing up to the West. Now, of course, in the case of something like um, Museveni, this is completely, this is completely um, hypocritical because he has collaborated with the West over the question of, you know, loans from the IMF, imposing authority, uh, imposing structural adjustment programs, etc., etc., as a result of which large sections of society have fallen into deeper and deeper poverty. There's much more unrest. Um, and uh, 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 at the same time, he is looking to try to get re-elected. They've just discovered some new oil wells in Uganda, which quite like, you know, they've been in power for 30 years, he'd quite like to be in power for another 30. He kind of rebelled and hesitated over, over whether to sign the, um, to the uh, anti-homosexuality bill because of his relationships with the West. And it's very hypocritical of him to pretend that he's standing up to the West like this, he's his great man, but of course, um, around the question of gay rights, he found himself able to mobilise a local um, a local population, and he found a very um, convenient scapegoat. You find the same thing happening in Malawi on the brink of, a, uh, of the president being exposed in the middle of a big corruption scandal, turning to the same um, turning to the same scapegoating. And you look at the comments from the and his supporters in that light. He says things like. Um, Outsiders cannot dictate to us. This is our country. If the West does not want to work with us because of the homosexuals, then we have enough space uh, to ourselves here. This is a victory for the family of Uganda, a victory for the future of our children. I hope the Obamas are receiving it live. Desmond Tutu, Cameron, Museveni has resisted them. The reference to Desmond Tutu is interesting, actually, because the question of South Africa is a kind of exception to the process that I just talked about in terms of the uh, anti-imperialist uh, um, struggles, which I'll come back to a bit later when I talk about resistance. But crucially, of course, what you had in South Africa was a resistance at the core of which was uh, a very powerful and organized uh, mass movement uh, mass movement of the working class, okay? But before I come to the question of resistance, I just want to talk a little bit about the more Islamist countries of the Middle East and North, uh, North, North Africa. Because here, I think it's important to say, so the imperialists have had a slightly different explanation here because they couldn't use the same argument about it being kind of, you know, backward and primitive and, uh, uh, and all the rest of it. So instead, they kind of talked a lot more about decadence and so on. Um, uh, um, but actually, despite the prejudice, in fact, the Islamic world was much modern-day prejudice. The Islamic world was much more accepting of same-sex practices. So, uh, researchers must, uh, Murray and Roscoe said it would be no exaggeration to say that before the 20th century, the region of the world with the most visible and diverse homosexualities was not northwestern Europe, but northern Africa and um, southwest Asia. One visitor to Paris from Morocco in the 1840s. Um, wrote back home saying, um, uh, fl uh, flirtation, romance and courtship um, for them takes place only with women, for they are not inclined to boys or young men. Rather, that is extremely disgraceful. And of course, what you have was the kind of, the, you know, the image of uh, uh, the, the kind of playground for the, for the West, people like Ian Forster losing his virginity to a man in Egypt in 1914, Gustave Flaubert, and, um, and, uh, and so on. 
Now, in, in the Arab nationalists that opposed imperialism were um, uh, uh, um, uh, you know, rebelled against this, and they took up the kind of language of decadence and said that we've allowed ourselves to fall into decadence, and that's why we were taken over by, uh, we allowed in, uh, 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 imperialism to triumph, and they saw homosexuality as part of that. Um, a, 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 a part of that decadence. And like in Africa, they adopted the language of modernization and the idea that they had their own superior moral culture against the West. So the history of same sex practices, which we know exists in terms of the poetry, the literature, and so on, was really written out of the history. People like the 9th century poet Abu Nawas, who wrote um, at great length about uh, love of boys and so on. Um, now, in many Arab countries, Arab nationalism was, you know, again, failed as with African nationalism in the, in, 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 and was replaced by um, Islamism, which looks, looks back even further in history to a purer time, but also uses precisely the prejudice of the uh, Victorian imperialists, but this time trying to turn it against the West, that the West are the sex obsessed bar, uh, barbarians in an, in, 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 in an inferior um, society. Now, we know that same-sex activity goes on in these, in these countries, um, in, 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 in many places, but not, often not in the way that we would identify um, as, um, uh, as LGBT, although there are groups emerging, you know, the, you know the, the spread of the internet, the fact that people have contact, that people take, play, take part in demonstrations and so on, the emergence of groups like Helen in Beirut, um, the Palestinian group, um, our cause. Um, I'm not going to talk a lot about the whole pinkwashing thing, by the way, which you know the people feel free to 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 to, to bring up. But um, you know we know that these groups do exist. But in general, most Arabs would not identify. Most Arabs who engage in same-sex practice would not identify as LGBT in the same way. They may have um, uh, same-sex lovers, but also they go on to marry and have children. Um, sometimes keeping those same-sex lovers, sometimes um, sometimes not. Although you did begin to see the emergence of, um, particularly in more urbanised middle-class areas, the development of something that we might more associate with some kind of gay scene or gay activity. For example, there was a raid on a uh, nightclub on a Cairo um, boat about, um, about, about, about five years ago. And I, I think that means really that uh, in terms of LGBT activity, we have to be a little bit careful about imposing our um, way of, um, uh, um, of, of organising um, uh, um, coming out and so on uh, on those countries. And I think that applies both in the Arab world and in African countries. And I think in that regard, actually, the intervention of people like Peter Tatchell can, can often be uh, extremely counterproductive. I mean, people in Uganda have said that it's not helpful to have that kind of uh, that, have that kind of intervention when Mussolini is arguing that he's standing up to the Westerns and um, and. Uh, and so on, and they have their own ways of organising um, uh, their uh, activism. So um, I think that's true. I, I think we have to be a little bit careful. I mean, there's a guy, I forgot his first name, is it Joseph Massad, who, um, uh, you know, who kind of goes to the extreme of, of, of kind of equating uh, people who fly rainbow flags on demonstrations. For example, there was an LGBT contingent on the big uh, anti-war march in Beirut in 2003, and he's kind of describing this as some kind of imperialist intervention because they're imposing the homo hetero binary on the gay movement in in, uh, in the Arab world, and that's a really imperialist. I think it's going a bit too far, to be honest. And I think if people want to come out and identify as LGBT, and that's part of the way that they see their struggle, I think it's very important for people to um, for people to uh, to um, defend that. So. We're really kind of coming on to the question of resistance. So I think the most important thing about the question of resistance is that it must come from within those countries and not be something that is imposed from without. And it's actually quite patronising to assume that there is no resistance inside these countries. You know, these countries aren't full of backward people who want to go around stoning um, all, gay, all gay people to death. But various points in time there have been various numbers of, uh, in the movements. There's an organisation called Smug in Uganda, Sexual, Sexual Minorities in Uganda, it's a bit of an unfortunate name anyway, um, which is a coming together of lots of different uh, LGBT uh, organisations in Africa. Now, of course, it's now um, having to go underground and be, you know, but it has operated openly, they're having Kampala in areas where um, the better off um, kind of urban elites have been able to buy 
um, little safe spaces for themselves and there have been elements of what we would identify as um, LGBT rights groups and so on. Um, a lot of it driven by the campaign around HIV and AIDS and having to start to become open in order to take those issues up, although of course that's slightly problematic for them because they don't want the question of um, homosexuality to be linked you know, with, with, with um, HIV AIDS in that kind of direct way. But nevertheless, it has been an impetus in people having to come out and talk more openly and in response when there's been um, negative reactions to that and campaigns against them, that in turn has kind of fueled a bit of what we would think of as more of a um, of a modern movement. Also developing the process, their own language, it's quite interesting actually. In uh, South Africa and other African countries, when I said that you know they don't necessarily identify as LGBT, they come up with their own acronyms. So they have MSM, which just means a man who sleeps with men, and WSW, which just means a woman who sleeps with women. Doesn't mean they necessarily identify as gay or bisexual or lesbian or whatever. They just say, "Oh, are you WSW?" Or, you know, um, and, and I think that's kind of. I think that's that development of vocabulary is quite interesting. I think mean, it's important that we don't impose Western stereotypes on uh, the movements. But I do think that what we can say is that across the world and throughout history, uh, class struggle um, has played a key role in the resistance. Whether you look at the question of the Russian Revolution, which I know has been discussed at length in various meetings here, and the way that they sought to make people's private sexual lives nothing to do with the state, and that people were free to exercise their sexuality uh, in any way they chose. Uh, something that was eventually driven back by um, Stalinism, and there's a kind of direct link from Stalinism to, um, to uh, Putin. Again, it's interesting in the question of Putin, because after Putin was elected last time around, there was a, several thousand people demonstrating against him. He wasn't looking particularly strong at that time. And actually, what was one of the things that he did was in bringing in the, uh, in bringing in the law against promoting homosexuality, also was a law against all sorts of demonstrations and all sorts of freedoms. It was a, you know, an attempt to really clamp down on any opposition that he was finding himself unpopular, and then doing what a lot of rulers do, you know, go and invade, you know, well, try and invade a few countries, do a little bit of imperialism, pushing around here and there. So, and, and, and it's interesting that he brought on board the Catholic Church to help him in that portrayal of himself as this strong man who's standing up for these pure values, standing up for the Russian, standing up for the Russian family and so on. It's interesting on the, in the Pussy Rider case actually that they they describe themselves as being lots of different things, feminists, autonomists, blah 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 blah. And uh, but one of the things they describe themselves out is Trotskyists, and I think that's fantastic. Because actually what that shows is that tradition of Trotsky of saying that we stand for all the oppressed people, we stand you know, against the oppression of people on the grounds of their sexuality actually has got a little bit of a residue there that's still going on inside Russia. I think that's brilliant, actually. Um, again, you look at the 1960s, 70s, you look at the Stonewall riots that came on the back of a big wave of class struggle and campaigning over the civil rights movement, the uh, Vietnam War and so on. You look at this country, the question of the miners' strike in 1984-85, I know a number of people have just watched the film on it, the role of gays and lesbians uh, uh, support the miners in that, to actually going and supporting the miners, that then being repaid with miners um, coming on and leading the gay pride demonstration and so on. Again, the question of South Africa I mentioned, the, 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 the role of the, working, the black working class in that actually meant that Far from just being a, a nationalist struggle, this was a class struggle that got rid of, that got rid of apartheid and started to question the basis of the whole system. And interestingly, there's a bit of a tie-up actually between um, gay campaigns in South Africa and the anti-apartheid movement. In fact, one of the ways that Nelson Mandela evaded capture was by um, being the chauffeur of a uh, gay rights, a white gay rights activist in South Africa, and also, no, Halifax was telling me that the East London Gay Collective in the 1980s, that was a little basically little squat in East London, but it was radical pe people who had been radicalised by the gay movement here and had become revolutionary socialists, provided a haven for people escaping apartheid um, and uh, 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 coming, um, coming, coming over here. So there was that tie-up, and it meant that. 
the uh, South African constitution became the first in the world that outlawed discrimination in its constitution, discrimination against people on the grounds of sexuality. But it also shows, of course, that the question of legal equality isn't enough because we still have the, you have the horrible instances of corrective rape in South Africa, where women, where lesbians being raped in, in order to allegedly um, kill them and so on. And it's an argument really that it's not just about legal equality, it's about uh, having to win uh, in society and uh, society having to live for people, which clearly the uh, current regime has not um, uh, has not done. And that's something that we see here in terms of the arguments around gay marriage, that despite we have that, that legislation, there are still many, many places where people can't be open and free. We still have the problem of uh, homophobia in schools. We have the attacks of Vauxhall recently. We have the horrible treatment of LGBT asylum seekers. Um, and so on. And I think, I think there are lots of things that are reminders to us that the games that have been won can also be taken away. The growth of UKIP and their homophobia, um, for example. Um, okay, I'm kind of running out of time, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna skip a little bit. Um, of course, one of the things that we don't know is what a part of the world, a truly revolutionary breakthrough is going to happen. If it's in Africa and Asia, the way in which the fight for um, a, 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 a free sexuality to express might not take the same form as here. It might use a different language, but we can be sure that if we want these games to be part of the movement, as they must be, then the revolution uh, must do two things. It must, uh, firstly, use the power of the working class to smash the capitalist state machinery and the wrong laws. It must also have revolutionary socialists at its heart, arguing that the revolution must be the um, festival of the oppressed. And I just wanted to finish with a little quote from the current Nigerian issue of Socialist Worker, which has taken up the question of the, um, uh, of the uh, anti homosexuality <coughs> bill. This is what our comrades in Nigeria are selling. I'll just quote you a couple of bits from it. The new law could result in two people of the same sex being sent to prison for 10 years just for holding hands, hugging or kissing in public. In a world so full of violence, hatred and discrimination, the government outlaws signs of affection, love and kindness. As socialists, we're against any oppression and discrimination which divides the working class. So we are against the oppression of women, we are against racism and ethnic conflicts. Similarly, we should, be, we should campaign against all discrimination and particularly legal action against homosexuals, lesbians and transsexuals. We need to remember that the Workers United will never be defeated. Okay, um, I, I just wanted to say a few words or ask, ask a few questions really on, on the subject of Russia, because obviously the fact that um, that they've introduced anti homosexual laws in Russia in the last few years, uh, forbidding the promotion of homosexuality, uh, which was very, has a, a rather scary parallels with the Section 28 that was introduced by the Thatcher government in the 1980s. Um, I, actually, I have a Russian friend who lives in the UK now with his, um, with his English partner. Um, he's he's, he's uh, 30, 30 years old and um, his, uh, some of the things um, he's told me about it is, is really interesting. But so first of all, even though there's a 30 years age difference between us and uh, three time zones, our, actually, our coming out experiences were, were remarkably similar compared with um, which, which is people his own age. Um, because we had to deal with the things like Section like 28 and, and, and homophobia. And the fact that um, in Russia, uh, Thatcher, Thatcher was. Um, Venerated in a similar sort of way that um, Gorbachev what, what has, was here um, in the 1980s, whereas in their own countries they were totally despised. So, you know, when Thatcher died and he was seeing all the postings on Facebook, all his Russian friends were sort of a bit respectful for her, and he was really quite well smacked to see some of the reactions from his English Facebook friends. So, no, we, so we, we managed to bring him up to speed on that. Um, but uh, in amongst all this, I, there was the whole question of the Winter Olympics and whether we should support a boycott of them when they when they were in Russia on account of the um, anti-homosexuality laws, because they, very prominent British people like like Stephen Fry were, were arguing actually quite 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 coherently and convincingly. I thought why why we should. Um, and then there was an article about the socialist worker uh, suggesting that. Uh, it wasn't appropriate because there wasn't the backing for a boycott within Russia. I mean, my general view on boycotts is obviously it's, it's not an absolute 
um, principle whether you have a boycott or not. It depends on the forces on the ground there if, if they have the support or not. So, um, I mean, when, when I read that article, it, interestingly though, when I read that article in the Socialist Worker, I actually went back to the source material that the article was quoting from, and it was well from the website of the Rus Russian LGBT group. And whereas, it, whereas uh, my interpretation of reading that um, article was, wasn't that they were against a, a, a boycott in principle, but they thought that a boycott wouldn't work. Yeah. They would have liked one, but it wouldn't have worked. And so I, mean, I think when, when you, there's a, so that's not just like with words, but I, I think that, might, that sort of affects how you, whether you support a boycott or not, because if, 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 if they think if, if they think a boycott's too dangerous and it will put people, people in danger or whatever, obviously you don't argue for a boycott. If you think they'd like a boycott, but they think a boycott wouldn't work, you can actually point to examples of South Africa where there was a boycott and it did work. So it's a, it's, it's a, how, 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 you, how you treat it is slightly different. So I'd be interested to know what the speaker or anybody else would think about that. I would like to come back on a couple of issues, possibly three. Um, first of all, I would like to look at the crime against nature issue. Now, I am no lawyer, but I know that precedence is important in law. And as precedence is important in law, I would like to look at three cases from the past. Two of them are from uh, 20th century in America. One was uh, fired against Satan for ruining a woman's life. One was filing against God for terrorizing humanity. And there is another one from Poland where a politician was um, uh, threatened by the right wing of the parliament um, with uh, filing against him a case of a crime against the Holy Spirit for asking to remove the cross from the uh, room of the Polish parliament. And now in all three cases there's one problem uh, and I think the that the crimes against nature share this problem, that you couldn't in any way deliver a message to one side of the process. Because you can't deliver a message to Satan, you can't deliver the notice to God, and you can't deliver the notice to nature either. Um, I don't actually quite see how anybody could ever commit sentence, uh, um, crime against nature in any way whatsoever. And if there is one, it would probably be more like what we do to an, uh, what you know, the system goes to the environment. Um, on another note, the rainbow that the speaker mentioned um, in Poland, I'm actually happy to be Polish, so uh, hence I know the politician, hence um, I know about the rainbow. Actually, there are two rainbows and both got burnt. Um, and some of the more tolerant wings of our local fascist organization said they wouldn't mind the rainbow. But the problem was that the rainbow stood on the uh, square of the Redeemer and in front of a church and they didn't like it, so there we are. Uh, finally, uh, recently in Poland we have improved on our export. We have actually exported an EMP to the European Parliament. It was so extreme that even Nigel Farage and Marine Le Pen rejected to work with him. Uh, he um, has a very interesting way of talking about gay people because he's to a degree, a mixture of economics of Margaret Thatcher and social views of Adolf Hitler. Um, he hates the state to such a degree that he believes that state should not in any way regulate uh, the relationships of, as he describes them, homos, which he believes is a word he, he himself created, and thus the word cannot be antagonistic. Um, he said that there are a very nice little tribe that has existed for a thousand of years and will never exist as long, and as long as they do not create uh, public disgust, as he says, it's all fine. So whatever they do in their own bedroom, he's okay. But he draws a distinction between the so-called homos and gays. Apparently gays are imported from the West and they are usually not even homosexual. They do not actually like the same gender. They are just a bunch of people who are supposed to create diversion and just generally be a nuisance. Thank you very much. from uh, Norwich SWP. Thanks, Sue, for a great talk. I really wanted to make the point uh, about why LGBT people should get involved in fights against austerity and why that's important and it's significant. I think uh, if you accept the evidence that when class struggle is higher or in revolutionary situations, it becomes easier 
to fight for LGBT rights. Then the converse is also important. So in a time of low class struggle, a uh, time when austerity or ruling class seems to be winning, then it becomes more difficult to fight for uh, LGBT rights. I think as in uh, Russia, where you can see that LGBT people are being scapegoated, and also in Greece, where they've really been at the sharp edge of austerity, and uh, people probably know that the fascist party, uh, Golden Dawn, leafleted the gay area uh, in Athens and said, you know, we've come from the immigrants and we're going to come for you next. And I think it's significant we recognise that and realise, therefore, why it's important we get involved and uh, fight against uh, scapegoating of all groups. So uh, I think this holds true for us in the UK as well, uh, because the reality is LGBT people are hit really hard uh, by the cuts. It's not that we should see ourselves as a separate group, but that we should get involved in the action that's taking place. But how are we affected? Well, we're affected by uh, job cuts in the public sector. A lot of LGBT people work uh, in the public sector. Uh, also services for trans people, where the NHS cuts are uh, impacting uh, really badly. Uh, you might have read about Chan Cross Hospital, where one of the surgeons has um, has resigned. There's only one surgeon now who's uh, operating on people who's uh, actually treating people there, so the waiting list has increased. So this is where the NHS cuts uh, are impacting as well. HIV services, uh, disability benefits and mental health services, uh, to, to name a, a few. Um, also, I think when it comes to uh, class and how it impacts uh, LGBT people differently, I think we see that people can't afford what they want. We're told we have a choice, but actually, if you're uh, a lesbian couple who wants to have a child, they want to go and get a, uh, a donor, go to a clinic, um, that can cost up to £2,000. So if you, you can't afford that, you potentially, as a couple, can't afford to go and have a child, and I think that's a terrible state of affairs. Um, also, uh, Sue talked about, um, Sue talked about uh, African countries, and we see here uh, in the UK that you know people there's been some campaigns about people seeking asylum in the UK, and I think we have to get involved in those campaigns and pressure the government to say people have got the right to stay here. I think it cuts through the whole idea about immigration, etc. And I think there was a lesbian, I'm sorry I don't know her name, I think it was from Uganda, and she felt she had to prove she was a lesbian in order to be able to stay in the UK and argue that she could stay here. And again, why should it be so um, uh, invasive? You know, these kind of laws and these kind of questions, I think that's something we have to argue against. And I was going to make one more point. Um, and my last point, really, uh, is about the importance of pride. So as well as getting involved in all the anti-austerity uh, activity, I also think that pride take on a new significance, globally as well. Because if, in some countries, they can stop people having pride, I think Moscow, uh, Sofia in uh, Bulgaria, I think recently they were stopped having their pride march, this also turns the clock back, and this is something we have to challenge. And so in countries where we can have pride, I think we're a million people, in uh, Madrid, which is just huge, and Spain obviously also a country that has um, that has uh, faced terrible austerity. Then I think it's it's uh, important that we all get involved in our fight as well as anti austerity. <laughs> People who went to the discussion after the miners' film at the uh, just before dinner, there was an interesting point that was made. Not just the miners led the Pride March in '85 after the support from the gay and lesbian support groups, but they actually moved the motion at the TUC to make gay and lesbian liberation part, uh, part of TUC policy to set up the set of structure and so on. And it's no coincidence, perhaps a couple of years later, that you got Section 28, and maybe that's partly you know, when the miners were defeated, it's partly the reaction that's always was to then go on the offensive ideologically in terms of attacking. There's been a gay, because I think the BMT would have been added a few years later, it's probably just there's been a gay at the time. But the trade unions aren't always so progressive, and when Cam was talking about, you know, we should, we should reduce aid to Africa with the Nancy Gables passed a year or two back, it's actually people, unfortunately, in my union who've got a motion passed, despite a very bitter argument from some of us, saying that actually we should, we should support this call, that we should put this motion to the Trade Union Congress, which is absolutely obscene, because it doesn't help the people in Africa who are LGBT, or you know, not straight anyway, who are campaigning for liberation, if we're seen to be actually arguing for cutting aid. I mean, regardless of the fact most of the aid that is spent on Western companies isn't particularly useful, the fact that we're seen to be actually restricting the flow of money into Africa doesn't actually help the, the course of 
of people fighting for liberation. It's, you know, it just shows that where poor politics and poor understanding of this can lead you. In terms of actually what we can do, I think there was, you know, when you look at, you know, when I see any adverts from, on, from gay youth, whatever, when you see the adverts advertising Israel as a, as, a play, as a gay friendly place, obviously it's not friendly if you're Palestinian, no matter what your sexuality. And, you know, so you, we can always protest about, about those sorts of issues. And I think it's extremely important. When it comes to the question of boycotts, I mean, the Palestinians have actually asked for boycotts. You know, there is a big movement around that. And that's, so it's fair enough, we should be calling for boycotts everywhere. But then, you know, if you're going to, you know, there's a call for the boycott of the, of the World Cup in Qatar because it's, you know, Qatar's a home, home and you know, very strong homophobic laws. But then, you know, why are, you, why are we following doing anything with FIFA at all? Because obviously FIFA has allocated that. I mean, quite obviously it's a corrupt decision because they can't even hold the cup at the time it's supposed to be held because it's too hot. But apart from that, if FIFA are going to allocate it, we should be, you know, we should be, it should not just boycott in Qatar. You should be talking about the whole, boycott the whole structure of the sport, which actually, you know, if you've been to the means on capitalism and the sport, you know, you'll see that they reflect all the ruling ideas of racism and sex and homophobia. And it's very strongly the binary gender notion of male and female, which is a whole, whole other issue. Of, you know, why do we have to make a decision? Why do our parents have to decide when you're born if you're not obviously one or the other, you know, get surgical intervention? Uh, for one in a thousand kids in, in the West. So you know, all these issues about why we have to boycott, if people call for it and it will help, that, that's one thing, but what we should be doing is being part of the, part of the movement against austerity and part of the solidarity with anybody fighting back against austerity and fighting back against dictatorial governments, you know, join the protests outside the Russian embassy, but you've always got to join the protests in your own country against your own austerity measures as LGBT as you can, and if you're comfortable with that, and show that we're part of the movement, and that way we'll get support back as the, as the LGBT community did from the miners. Okay, two points really. Uh, I'm really glad that Sue took up the issue of racism, really, because I think it's very important to see what is happening in terms of the way that sometimes there is a reflection that yeah, some societies are backwards compared to Western countries. But that's also reflected, I think, in terms of the way that the LGBT issue is sometimes dealt with in Britain. So, for example, last year, um, I was at the TUC LGBT conference, and the FBU had a motion on the Arab Spring saying that all Islamic countries had always been homophobic, carrying on the narrative, really, of Islamophobia in this country. And I think it's very, very important as socialists, as Lenin called, called socialists the tribunes of the oppressed, that we actually take up those arguments and argue against all forms of pre oppression. And when these oppressions intersect, we actually argue against all oppression. And I think that's really important. I think that comes out in the, the Birmingham schools issue because you know when one Ofsted inspector says to a child, are you homophobic to a Muslim child, that is a disgrace. It's disgusting in terms of the way that they manipulate one oppression in order to create another oppression. So they use LGBT oppression in order to justify racism. And I think that's disgusting, really. I think it's so important in, in terms of where we stand that we are clear that we're against all forms of oppression. The second point I want to make is about schools and about what we do as trade unionists. Because uh, the NUT has just done a survey uh, which shows that uh, uh, LGBT History Month only happens in less than 13% of schools in Britain. That is shocking because it is the duty of schools in order uh, to, to uh, promote an environment where people and uh, students grow up not having to fear their oppression and it's the duty of schools to do something about that. Uh, in my school we've celebrated LGBT uh, History Month for the last five years and it's had a brilliant effect in terms of uh, students coming out, students taking assemblies on, on LGBT oppression, teachers coming out, um, and last year there were all sorts of activities, for example there was a, a, a gig with 20 bands on, where we had the parents coming in, watching their kids, playing music, and sitting there waving their little rainbow flags in the audience. It was breaking down the barriers and actually making LGBT ideas and LGBT um, you know, just acceptance and understanding and support part of the mainstream. And I think that's what we have to do. But I don't think that is just down to what happens in schools. I think that should be part of what the trade union movement does. And we want to make uh, LGBT History Month in February as important as Black History Month is anyway at the moment. Okay.
Thanks, I'm uh, Phoebe, and I'm a Unison member in, in Camden. Um, and recently, in the, in the build-up to the, the whole the minus um, strike film being made, we were contacted about what we were doing through the support networks and stuff when, when the minus strike was going on. Um, so I was going through a lot of the old magazines and stuff that we had in our branch office. And what was really interesting was actually seeing the, and hearing the stuff in the film from Mike Jackson, the, the lesbian and gays against the, the for the miners, or what they call themselves, support the miners. Um, and seeing that, and that was all documented in our, our magazines and all the support we did. But interestingly, after the miners strike was over, I, I read through the, the next few, because there was a <coughs> of, you know, still keeping contact with the, the miners and stuff. Um, and it was the explosion of um, lesbian and gay issues and the building of uh, lesbian and gay um, groups in, in work. Um, and I, I think what one leads into another is actually the, the proliferation of, of solidarity meant that people felt that they could come out at, at work. And particularly when, I can't remember who said, I think um, Merlin was talking about the, the Section 28, it was in uh, 1988, it came in, 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 into, enacted. Um, but that's when there were all the groups within a lot of workplaces. Nowadays, actually that's what, 30 years ago, um, when, when groups started building, and while we've still got huge problems at, at work about um, general issues about um, homophobia and racism and stuff like that, it is nothing like what it used to be in the workplace. And I think that the, the thing that the, um, Sue touched on at the end about actually the collective organisation, trade unions and stuff, actually it's a very, very different picture now. So we do have, um, the, there is the TUC LGBT um, conferences that happen. In unison there is um, LGBT groups and a whole number of branches and used to be very, very active, which led to a national setting up of uh, lesbian and gay originally, and then it was LGBT well, probably about eight or ten years ago now. Um, so those issues are, are in the forefront. So there's the motions in conferences and actually the stuff that comes out from our national union is, is wholeheartedly, it, that's part of, of, of the picture that we do. I'm not trying to paint a picture that everything's rosy out there, but actually it's mainstream, particularly in trade unions. The one thing I wanted to say was about the pink washing stuff because in, in London, in the London region, the, the LGBT uh, regional group is actually one of the areas where there is a, a lot of political stuff that goes on. Um, and the because they linked um, the issue around Palestine about oppression um, and, and what's going on in, in Israel, they're the ones who took up the, the, the pink washing, but because they had a lot of respect in terms of the international committees and actually being able to put stuff out there, they led the way in terms of not just the pink washing, but actually because they had a great tradition around Palestine. So it's the linking together of the, 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 the groups that are, who, who are facing oppression and, and imperialism and all stuff like that actually is really, really helps to, to be able to build a bigger picture of how we fight back. Um, I just uh, wanted to share a quote with you that I came across a few weeks back in uh, social media. Uh, and I think uh, it was uh, actually a quote by the, the actor Morgan Freeman. Um, and I don't know what context it's taken out of, but I just thought it was interesting or funny or whatever. Uh, it goes, um, I hate the word homophobia. It's not a phobia, you're not scared, you're an asshole. <laughs> um, and uh, while that is very, like, you could call it aggressive, I think uh, there's some truth about it because it's, uh, with this word and these other phobias that we talk about, it's like, well, now we've just accepted uh, the word phobia as, as a word to describe these people who seem to have some kind of irrational fear of um, LGBT people or Islam or whatever, but um, really the word phobia maybe well it it could sound like you give these people an excuse because a phobia is is a condition you can have uh, maybe not not something you're born with but something you 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 can you can have like along the lines of your life where you had some kind of fear of, you know, spiders or small spaces or open spaces or crowds or whatever. And I don't think it's sufficient to say that these um, people who who s speak badly about 
uh, minorities, the people that they oh, it's because they have this fear of these people. It's 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 not it's not a fear. It's not a phobia. It's um, maybe for some people, it's ideas that have been pushed into their heads by people who want to to create scapegoats or whatever, like like. Uh, the, the word scapegoat was mentioned earlier, or whatever. But I think, I think uh, Morgan Freeman is right when he says that that it's not a phobia, and people are not really scared, and we should not give them that that they they're just scared, and that we should just educate them to not be scared. We should not accept any kind of behavior that uh, well that's against these these uh, these minorities of people. <laughs> um, I think that all of the kind of homophobic definitions of what normal sex is and what it should be and everything is focuses a lot on like, the actions that you're actually doing, like the sex acts that take place, and that's mostly like anal sex with among men. Um, I would just like to remind everybody that heterosexual couples probably have more anal sex than homosexual men. Um, yeah, and more often. And also, Stephen Fry has never had anal sex in his life, and he's been gay forever. Um, and all of the MPs, you know, and the priests that have been molesting young boys, they're paedophiles, they're saying, you know, they're, they're homophobic, but they're paedophiles, and that's okay, and they can sodomize young boys, and they can touch little girls, and that's fine. Um, yeah, so just a reminder that all the MPs are having anal sex right now. That's what's going on here. Thank you. Well, look, uh, I think the last speaker has rather graphically um, uh, explained the whole problem with trying to put people into categories of identification because of their sexual practice. I mean, this is something that just doesn't work really, does it? You know, and actually, you know, e even in the West, this is a very modern invention. Um, you know, it's not, it's not just that this is something that is foreign to, um, you know, the Arab world or to Africa. This is a very recent invention in the West, as I talked about before, that, that, that idea that you fit into this category or into this box. Um, uh, uh, rather, you know, rather than something that really is much more fluid in terms of the way that people actually live their lives and what they do and, and, uh, and, uh, and how and who they choose to love and have sex with and so on. Um, so, you know, so this is a recent invention and I think that part of the problem when the comrade talks from Lebanon really is really, it, it is that whole problem of identity politics, isn't it? It is that whole problem of starting with how do you identify yourself? And I think now, when you look at countries which um, didn't historically have an LGBT movement in the same way as emerged in the West in the 60s and 70s, it's very, it's very difficult to just then impose those labels on them. Obviously, with the development of the internet and greater connectivity and people, you know, getting curious about their sexuality, you know, going online, finding groups, thinking, oh, that's what I'm going to call myself then. But it's not the same as being part of a movement that has genuinely existed and developed. In, the, in, in, in those countries, and I think, and as I said before, I think people will develop their own languages in the course of the struggle to explain how they want to describe themselves. You know, it just so happened that out of the Stonewall movement, people decided to call themselves gay. That's what they were going to say. I'm gay, and I, I'm gay, and I'm proud of it. But then look what happened. You know, then it was then it was lesbian and gay. Then it was LGBT. Now people want to put LGBTQ or even get LGBTQQI in some circumstances. I'm not against people wanting to put all these letters on the end, but you can see the problem of trying to uh, of trying to start from a situation of how you identify yourself. And I think actually instead we have to go back to starting from the question of class because that unifies everybody. That is what unifies everybody. And they're fighting on the basis of class means that you have to fight both imperialism and oppression at the same time. And I think that's really what we have to fight for. We have to fight for um, the fusing together of those um, of those things. I know it's a I know it's a bigger discussion, and it will be interesting to talk afterwards. But you know, I I do think we have to reject the route of going down identity politics, and we have to talk instead about something that is based on class and that is pulling together 
Um, but it's putting together all those different things. I mean, if you look, for example, you know, the way in Tavia Square that people started to raise the question of women's rights, of women being harassed in the square, that I think out of the struggle, you know, they, so they had to develop their own ways of organising. How would they go and protect women in the square and so on? Or should they tell women not to come in the square? They had to take up all those kinds of questions. And I think that when that mass struggle was breaking out around in, in, in those countries, I, I think people will start then to think about how seriously do we take these issues up, what's the best way to take them, what's the, the best way to take them up. Now that's not to say that we should avoid the question of defending those groups who have chosen to identify themselves and have chosen to come out and have chosen to wave the rainbow flag and are then finding themselves attacked. I think absolutely we have to say no, but it's not true to say that they are doing that as a of imperialism. Come on. George Bush, when George Bush went to go and bomb Iraq and Afghanistan, was he doing it waving a rainbow flag? No, he wasn't. You know, and then therefore it's wrong to equate that with imperialism. And we, so we have to defend the right of people who want to do that. At the same time, as I think, be open to probably a much richer um, and, and, and you know a, 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 a form of, of fighting for oppression that will develop out of movements alongside the fight for um, alongside the um, fight for imperialism. I just wanted to come back to um, a couple of other points that people made. The question of the boycott in Sochi. I think there's a problem really, isn't there? Because the law was passed, and then how long was it until the Olympics? You know, the, actually, the people talk about the boycott campaign in South Africa. This took years. It took years. You know, it wasn't something that you can, in a few weeks, go, oh, we're going to boycott the Olympics. What does it actually mean exactly? And I think it's, you know, I just think it's, it was just a very difficult thing to do that wasn't really going to work. I do think that some people found some very good ways to protest within the Olympics, didn't they? People were wearing rainbow shoelaces and things like that. And I think that was important. And I do think that we should say to our governments here that they could have done a lot more to put on those kinds of protests them, uh, themselves rather than just making um, mealy mouthed, um, me, 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 me now de 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 declarations, but you know the question. You know, in South Africa, it is the case that there was a mass campaign going on inside South Africa itself that was also calling for the boycott. So I think, you know, the question of Palestine, for example, at the moment, I think it's really important that we throw ourselves behind the boycott campaign and that you do boycott Israeli goods. It's something concretely that people can do as part of the movement. I mean, come on, you know, if people are being you know, bombed to bits in their beds. The least you can do is refuse to buy Israeli goods in the local shop and, you know, launch a campaign um, and so on. You could do something. I don't think, I don't think it was quite the same around the question of the, um, of the Sochi Olympics in terms of what people could practically, um, could, could, um, could, 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 could practically deliver. I do think it's right that comrades talked about, um, I think the question of the science seekers, by the way, is very important because it does expose the hypocrisy very, very well. You're absolutely right. People are asked to do all sorts of, you know, really disgusting, invasive things to try and prove, you know, that you enjoy. Let's have a photograph showing you enjoying having um, anal sex, for example, you know. And if you're not prepared to do that, you can always go back home and just do it secretly and nobody will notice and you won't get beaten up, you know what I mean? Therefore, we're going to send you home. The government's record on its treatment of LGBT asylum seekers is absolutely... Um, is, absolutely, is absolutely disgraceful. But when we talk about the campaign against austerity, you see, and uh, I, I think it's interesting that when the Occupy movements broke out, actually, rainbow flags were quite a big part of it. LGBT groups were quite a big part of it. If you look at Gezi Park, um, in the, you know, the explosion in Turkey, it was quite interesting there, because there has been a burgeoning, a slowly burgeoning LGBT group inside Turkey. And they were very prominent in the occupations in Gezi Park, but so were Muslim groups, and actually socialists had to conduct an argument about why the Muslim groups should come and stand alongside the LGBT groups, and the LGBT groups should accept the, the Islamic groups in. Um, uh, 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 and so and that was something that socialists had to do to actually fight for that unity within that um, within that occupation. Um, actually, a comrade told me uh, told me earlier a story about going to. Uh, Zimbabwe at the end of the, uh, uh, I, think, uh, I think it was around about the year 2000, 2004, something like that, and actually taking part in a march that had been organised that the comrades had pushed for through the Zimbabwean um, TUC um, that was marching in defence of gay rights, that was attacked by the police, and you know, there was like, you know, this comrade had gone over there from London, you know, thinking he got these guys that were just, you know, getting whipped and stuff. Come on, comrades, we've got to keep going, we've got to keep going, and it was quite, you know, but this is what our comrades did, this is what our comrades are doing in these countries, standing up and taking it, because actually it's a principle for us that every comrade, whether you're gay or straight or black or white or man or woman or whatever you are, that every comrade fights every oppression. 
That is a principle within the um, revolutionary socialist tradition. So um, actually in Greece, somebody talked about Greece, the, um, I was talking to panels from Greece earlier and he just said that the, there's a group of striking women cleaners at the economics ministry, been on strike for quite a long time, that one of their first marches, um, some gay rights groups marched with them. Absolutely right that they've also been under attack from the fascists and therefore that's become part of the resistance. And they marched together and then when the gay pride march went past, yeah, when, when, uh, went past the ministry, all the cleaners came out and clapped them. So that solidarity was returned in a bit of the way that it was around the question of LGBT support the miners. Again, these things are fought for. This yeah, are fought for by socialists within these um, within these um, resistance uh, within with, with, within these resistance movements. So really, I just want to finish by talking about you know a lot of people here have probably been coming to lots of meetings this weekend and thinking. Oh, should I join the SWP? Should I not? Should I really get involved? Should we really be fighting for a revolution? Really, I think if you're really serious about fighting, genuinely for a better kind of society and genuine central liberation, if you look at the question of what's happening around the world, you know, whether it's in Russia, whether it's in Uganda, where, uh, you know, whether it's in Egypt, um, you know, I do think that you have to bear in mind the words of somebody who was a revolutionary, not in our tradition, but stood up against American imperialism, a man called um, Ho Chi Minh in Vietnam. When a group of, when a, when a group of, uh, of socialists went out to go and see him and said, what can we do in our country to support you? His reply was, build the revolution at home.